Hi and welcome to this edition of Extension Live, I'm Bob Schuster. For the next 30 minutes or so, we're going to discuss an ongoing issue involving farmers and tall fescue. Tall fescue is a popular grass used for grazing, hay, and erosion control in eastern United States. But experts believe this grass could be responsible for more than a billion dollars a year in livestock production losses. A billion dollars. Clemson experts warn livestock producers to protect their herds from a fungus found in some tall fescue. To help South Carolina livestock owners learn management techniques and how to replant their pastures with a new non-toxic fescue, the Clemson Cooperative Extension Service and other institutions are teaming up with the Alliance for Grassland Renewal to hold one-day workshops for producers in five states in 2018. We'll talk about these workshops in just a few minutes, but let me introduce you to Dr. John Andre, Forage Specialist and Director of the Simpson Research and Experimental Station, or Education Center here on Clemson's campus to help sort us all, this things out, all these things out. John, welcome to the show. Thanks. First, let's dive into this thing. First off, tell us, tall fescue, what is it? What's the problem? Um, tall fescue is, uh, it's, it's the most, probably the most important cool season perennial forage in the United States. Um, it's over, it's on over 30 million acres hmm. um, and really concentrated in our area of the country. Most, almost all of those acres are in a, in a, what's called the tall fescue belt, which, which ranges from, you know, central, southern Missouri, down into northern South Carolina, northern Georgia, northern Alabama. Um, it's a, it's an incredible, incredibly useful grass. Um, a lot of fall and winter production, so it really cuts out our hay needs. Um, very drought tolerant, very grazing tolerant, and uh, so it's, it's it's an incredibly useful grass. Um, it's it's here for a reason. Uh, the problem with that grass is yeah, there's is always a problem. There's a problem. Man. There's always a there's always a <clears throat> sure a, an issue, and and that's that this grass has a fungus growing in it, uh, in between the plant cells inside the plant. You can't see it with a naked eye. You can't walk out into your your pasture and tell if it's a toxic tall fescue plant, uh, but that fungus produces um, compounds that are toxic to animals. Uh, those compounds are, are actually quite similar to LSD. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's, uh, and those, those toxicity issues create that $1 billion loss to the beef cattle industry alone. Yeah. Now it's not something new. No. We've known about it for a while. Thought we had it fixed out. Yeah, yeah. Go back there and let's discuss We've, it. We've, uh, well, fescue, <clears throat> Fescue is relatively new to the U.S., uh, you know, compared to some other forages, but it, it was released, tall fescue was released as a forage by the University of Kentucky in, uh, in the 40s. Just blame it on the bluegrass day, right? It's, ta it's Kentucky's <laughs> problem. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, so, so that was discovered in 1931 on a farm mm -hmm. in eastern Kentucky by a county agent, by, by extension. And uh, he, he's, Mr. Fergus realized all the benefits of this plant. It was tough. It, it it grew in the in the winter. It survived heavy grazing, and Kentucky released this again. He discovered it in 1931. That's the Kentucky 31 variety, that's still in place today, and uh, and that that was released widely through the U.S. A lot of South Carolina producers, Alabama, Georgia producers actually produced seed of this variety in the in the 60s, 70s, and, and made a good bit of money producing seed in this region. Uh, we did. We discovered it was toxic. Didn't really know why until the 80s, um, and uh, figured out this fungus was producing the, the toxins. And pretty simple, right? You take the fungus out, the problem goes away. So, so we uh, we did that. Uh, we, being the land grant system, did that. Uh, Auburn was the first to release that. AU Triumph was that variety. Pulled that fungus out. No toxicity problems. No issues whatsoever, except in couple years those stands started to die mm. and and the fescue went away and we figured out hey that that fungus is responsible for introducing grazing tolerance to the plant introducing uh, uh, pest resistance like nematodes and some insects to that plant and and drought and grazing tolerance so it's uh, the fungus is there for a reason nature nature has reasons for including do this. we know what alerted us to the issue 
at first in the 80s what, what, what the problem was? Um, Did you see what a, a loss in production? Of yeah, cattle or? We, I, th I think uh, there were reports in the, even in the, in the late 50s, early 60s that, that things weren't quite right with this. Um, cattle had rough hair coats, for example. Uh, gains weren't nearly as high on, on these tall fescue plants as they were in orchard grass and, and other forages. So they, they knew there was an issue, they just didn't know what. So there was this, this huge detective you know, mystery is as, spectacular. As, yeah, what's going on? Yeah, right. And and so they were, and and it's not an easy thing to find. This this again, nobody suspected a fungus really, mm -hmm. and and that fungus, most of those funguses that you see on cereal rye or other things are are obvious. They grow on, on the seed heads, or they they erupt out of the side of the plant. This fungus lives entirely inside the plant for its entire life cycle. So there's no signs of, of there being a fungus there. So it was, it was a hard nut to crack yeah, uh, to, sure. to find what was going on. So 86 years of toxic grasses has is, is been in the works. Now all of a sudden we're back to, okay, we got to figure out what's going on here again. Let's get together and, and see what we can do. Yeah, well, That's where we are now. Right? That's where we are now. And, and so they took that fungus out. It, it failed. You know, the plants failed. A lot of people spent a lot of money killing toxic fescue, planting endophyte free, fungus free fescue, and that, that fescue of course, it, at least in this part of the country, failed. It, it died, so a lot of people are out a lot of money. Now that works further up in the upper Midwest, you know, southern Wisconsin, northern Missouri, those types of areas. Uh, but, but the people in the south had no options. That fungus free didn't work. So, so uh, about the late 90s, uh, Scientist at the University of Georgia, and in cooperation with New Zealand, mm. uh, found a found a solution. So back to the drawing table they went, and figured out what they needed to do. Yeah, yeah. Some some really bright people in New Zealand. You know, this is one of those things in, at a at a meeting somewhere. A fescue breeder, a tall fescue breeder from Georgia, met up with a uh, Dr. Joe Bouton. Met up with a, a an endophyte. You know, a, a plant pathologist or an endophyte person from New Zealand who had a worldwide collection of these funguses and <laughs> and you know just by chance one guy said I've got these these funguses that don't produce toxins and the plant breeder said wow I've got these 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 varieties where that I think they would work really well in and so a, a marriage was born and it, it wasn't easy it took it took several years and a lot of money to figure it out but they they finally lit on marrying the right endophytes, non-toxic endophytes, with the right tall fescue varieties, and, and they were off to the races. So now we've got a, a fescue with that fungus in it that doesn't produce the toxic problems, but has those drought tolerance um, traits and, and grazing persistence traits that the endophyte free plants didn't. It's like the, the perfect, you know, the, the perfect marriage of those traits. Most people so. in my world collect press credentials. This guy's collecting bacteria and fungus. Uh, funguses. Funguses yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, so now we haven't complete, completely eradicated this disease, but we've got it under control now, we think. We've got a solution. Yes. Yeah, yeah the, it's, if, if you use a flu analogy, there's plenty of flu out there. Yep. Uh, we we got we to gotta eradicate uh, some, of these, some of these pastures. Okay, so. let's talk about how it's affecting not just livestock. I mean, well, all sorts of life. cattle, horses, right. goats. Talk about how it's affecting those. Sure. Um, the, well, the the biggest economic impacts in South Carolina and and really in the United States are are with beef cattle. It's uh, because beef cattle are are grazing these thirty million acres. Uh, so and so the the one billion dollar in losses are. Are due mainly to decreased conception rates. So, so cattle grazing this tall, pure tall fescue, pure toxic tall fescue, mm -hmm. in a controlled breeding season, controlled 90-day breeding season, may have conception rates uh, I've seen in the high 40s. We've had research here at Clemson that had you know 44% conception rates on 100% toxic fescue. Uh, but but even even with clovers and crabgrass and some other dilutants of that toxin you can still have 20, 30 percent reduction in, in conception rates. That's a huge economic loss to oh, beef yeah. cattle. And, and we've seen decreased weaning weights anywhere from 40 to 70 pounds in some cases. Wow. So that's, that's, that's significant. Yeah, at $1.40 a pound this year, that's, yeah. that's over 100 bucks a calf if you get 70 pounds lost weaning weight. Yeah. So, so beef cattle 
really are driving the economics here. But hey, it, it affects, these toxins affect particularly brood mares, like mares carrying uh, foals. Uh, they severely impact those brood mares. Not as much um, uh, horses that, that aren't carrying, that aren't pregnant, you know, just growing growing horses, but, but mares carrying foals, those mares tend to carry on, uh, carry uh, those foals a lot longer. They have real thick placentas, red bags, and and they don't drop milk. So a lot of times those foals will, well, 80% of the time, if you leave uh, these these mares on toxic tall fescue, they'll lose the foal. So, um, mm. and, and the horse people have figured this out and they've, they've eliminated tall fescue altogether. Or they, they provide domperidone, which was developed here at Clemson to, to help offset those effects. So. So there are solutions there, but it's it's serious with with mares and foals. So I would think, especially in Kentucky, now they're doing away with that tall fescue. Yeah, all together, these horse farms. That's big horse country. Right? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm yeah. I'm not in Kentucky, but I'm sure yeah. those big horse farms in Kentucky have 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 gone to bluegrass, orchard grass. I would think Timothy, so. other options. Yeah. Um, I would assume you're not a numbers guy, but is there a way to put a thumbprint on the economic impact? What it means just to South Carolina? I know it's a billion. Overall, throughout the country, yeah, it's a billion but, to the U.S. And, yeah. and really, I should figure out um, how many cattle are in the tall fescue count. You know, we can look at the counties: Anderson County, Oconee County, Pickens County, uh, Newberry County. There, there are some big cattle counties that have predominantly tall fescue. I've not figured that out. It's hard to even get an it's hard to get a number even on how many acres of toxic tall fescue we have in the in the state. But it's several hundred thousand. So the the impacts are significant. Oh, sure. Uh, I don't mean to be damning the, the tall fescue people, but is there a, maybe a better grass that could be brought into this fold? That, um, you know, to, yeah, I mean, is it is it to that point where it's like maybe we need to start looking at other options? That's that's sort of what's happened over time. Is as some of these toxic you get a drought year and the toxic fescue thins and crabgrass and Bermuda grass and Dallas grass and some of these warm season grasses fill in. Those are great diluents, particularly in the hot summer months when when these animals are suffering from from the tall fescue toxicosis. Um, but but as far as you know, those grasses, all the grasses I just named, don't produce any forage in as it gets cold in the fall through the winter months and early spring. So you've got all those months you need to feed hay. We we can plant orchard grass and timothy and yeah. and other cool season perennials here, but they're not gonna make it. We're just too severe of a of a of an environment for those species. Yeah. So tall fescues are It's important. It's it's an important yeah. forage species. It's, it's here, here for a reason. Yep, here for a reason. Okay. Okay, so now that moves me to what we're here for because now you guys have developed this workshop, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. Um, I know we've got a little you know, graphic of the workshop coming up. Uh, tell us a little about it. I think it's called the Novell Tall Fescue Renovation Workshop. Yeah, these, up in March. These, you know, I mentioned that that scientist in New Zealand that had that had had the fungus collection. These are these are these novel endophytes that that don't produce toxins, but but produce other compounds that help the plant. Um, we can't plant orchard grass. We can't plant. We can't get orchard grass or timothy and these cool season species to survive here, but we can get tall fescue to survive if it's got an endophyte in it. So, you know, these these new, I keep saying new, but they, they were new when I was a new forage specialist at uh, uh, in 2000. They were just released then. We've got these, these novel endophyte containing tall fescues that will survive here that don't produce those toxins. So we can get that increased animal performance um, with these animals with tall fescue, so uh, so this workshop is gonna is gonna talk educate people mm -hmm. about about these new tall fescues. Um, seed companies have have helped put this on. There's there's uh, we'll have about fifteen uh, different endophyte fescue combinations for them to look at in the field. All the commercially available tall fescues uh, that are on the market. We'll, we'll show those producers those tall fescues. We'll teach them how to replace their toxic fescue with non-toxic fescue. And for those acres that they can't replace, whether that's rented land or steep land or, or as they transition, we'll teach them how to manage that existing toxic tall fescue to make it less toxic, whether adding clover, that type of thing. Is, is this gonna be ex an expense to the farmer and is there gonna be some subsidies through the government that may help them 
redo some of this? Or there, or there are some. Out? There are some cost share options in in converting this. We'll have uh, Jill Clawson with um, our state grazing lands specialist with NRCS at the workshop to talk about those cost share options at this workshop. So, so she'll be on hand at, during the lunch hour to talk about about uh, potential cost shares. Mm -hmm. um, but, but really, the, with the with the economic impacts on with decreased production, this this thing really pays for itself. Oh yeah, as well. it's going so, to pay for itself yes. over the yeah. over the long haul because people are going to say, "Hey, I, if I don't do this, I'm going to lose more cattle." Yeah, if you've got a if you've got a fifty or sixty percent conception rate in your beef herd, this uh, and this this thing will pay for itself in two, three, four years. Oh yeah, and, and that's another impact of, of this workshop. We'll have a we'll have an economic section of of this workshop with. Um, there's there's been a group of, of four or five ag economists and forage specialists developing a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet, uh, that will provide to attendants that they can punch in their production costs, they can punch in their conception rates, weaning weights, and and it'll give them uh, an economic analysis, a, a time to payback on these conversions yeah. as well. And you've guys uh, got some people coming from Missouri, from North Carolina State. So I mean, we do. The country is going to be well represented this here. It's going to. This is a this is a stout workshop. Yes, we've, we've got. Uh, and there's again, there's five in the in the U.S. They're going to start in Missouri on March 6th. So if anybody's watching Missouri, uh, Kentucky March 8th, then they'll come to South Carolina uh, the, the following Tuesday. They'll be here near Clemson at uh, at the uh, Center for Applied Technologies on Westinghouse Road in, in Pendleton. Then they'll go to Raleigh the next day, and then Rafine, Virginia, up in the upper part of the, uh, the of the Shenandoah Valley for the last workshop. So, so five workshops this year. I think there'll be six next year. We'll also be on the list in 2019. So if you can't come this year, put it on your calendar for next year. What's the number one hope, if you will, to come out of this workshop? Um, mainly, to, my biggest hope is to is for people to realize they have a problem. You know, um, do they and, not see that? Well, it's it's very it's very easy not to realize that that you've got a toxicity problem. If your cows look like your neighbor's cows and they look like the cows down the road, yeah, everyone's everyone's cattle has rough hair coat. I don't have a I don't have a pasture problem. If I've got it, everybody's got it. Well, everybody's got it. So some people don't don't realize that that this problem is is so severe. Also, if you've got a if you've got an extended calving season, if you're calving four, five, six, twelve months out of the year. Those cows will catch eventually and get bred, and you may think, "Well, I'm, all my cows are having calves." Well, they are, but it's over a long time period, and you do have a problem. So, mm -hmm. getting the word out, getting people to realize they've got a problem, getting people—you know—in this workshop, we'll look at that fungus through a microscope, and you'll you'll see it. It, it becomes not an imaginary problem, but a a, a tangible problem uh, that that you can see with your own eyes. And then hopefully we can convince some people to to convert with these new varieties. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that the the land grant universities are probably doing their job right now at, at high level communicators that they are, uh, especially in South Carolina, the Clemson being the land grant university, that all the extension agents are out there with their cattle farmers saying, yep. "Hey guys, yep. this is going on. Yep. Here's a workshop that's going to be available. I think you need to come. Maybe you farmers over here with two or three pieces of cattle might might not, but you guys over here with you know, two, three hundred head of cattle. You probably need to come to this workshop. Yeah, and we'll and we'll have we'll have agents there. We'll also have some producers there uh, from who have converted uh, their their toxic fescue to non toxic fescue, and they'll share their their successes and and they'll share their problems with that as well. This this isn't simple um, to do. There there are some things you need to consider as you as you take land out of production and and you know there there's some hay needs or. Or um, or other things you have to consider when you do this. So so these producers will give their real world experiences. Do we have any online data at this point, knowing how well this conversion has helped so far, or are we still too early in the process for that? Um, well, that, those producers will give the their yeah. their data, and yeah. and that that was the seventy pound increase. In so the don't give it away right, right here is uh, what you're saying. It, yeah. There'll be yeah. it, it's it's a positive impact, a, a, a dramatic positive impact, and you don't have to convert. You know that's another thing that'll come out of this. I think. Is is people think well? I've got to I've got to convert my whole farm in one year from toxic to non toxic. That's not true at all. If if you take if you can eventually get to just converting a quarter of your farm from toxic to non toxic fescue, that can make incredible impacts on your conception rates as as well and incredible economic impacics. So so there are this isn't an all or none 
uh, issue. There are, there are ways that you can phase this in and you don't have to phase all the way in, particularly if you have rented land. It, it's hard to go in and, and spend a couple hundred dollars an acre on, on land that you may not be able to graze next year. Mm -hmm. So, so there, we'll talk about all those things uh, in the entire system in this workshop. Who in particular, John, are we trying to market for this workshop? Uh, farmers mostly, but farm managers? Who, who else in particular? We, if, we you're, if you're a beef cattle producer with, with tall fescue, and come on, come on. Uh, it, it's important. Um, if if you're a, a sheep or goat producer, there are fewer of those, but but it impacts them as well. That's that's another um, that's another impact that, that we can address. If you're a horse producer that wants to that, that's breeding mares, this is something you can attend. We won't we don't typically focus on a on an animal species. This is a this is a grass workshop. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we'll talk about about these livestock species. So really, any any species that's impacted by tall fescue will gain from this. It will be geared more toward beef producers, just because that's that's our predominant audience. But anyone with horses, sheep, goats, uh, beef cattle, dairy cattle uh, can benefit from this. I, I left out dairy. I didn't didn't mean to do that. But you know that that's a not many people graze dairy cows anymore. But mm -hmm. but. Uh, this decreases milk production about 25 percent in dairy cattle and beef cattle and sheep. We've got data on that from sheep as well. So, John, you've got an extremely important uh, month coming up uh, leading into this workshop. Uh, I think it's important for the farmers to know. I think it's important for our extension agents to get out there and get the word out that this workshop is available, that it's coming. Um, I know you've got about 40 slots about uh, available. Is 40, that going to be enough? Uh, it, it's going to, I hope it fills up. Uh, yeah. We've got 40 slots. We've got about 15 committed right yeah. now, 40 slots plus the speaker, so there'll be 50 people in the room. Sure. But uh, there's about 25 slots left and about a month to go, and, and I, I expect it to fill. So um, please please give us a call, go online and register. We've got a couple different options with I that. I think we've got a, a, a graphic on, on screen that'll tell us where we can go and register, but give us the what, who, what, when, where uh, from the, the workshop, March 13th? Uh, March uh, 13th. Uh, in, in Pendleton, South Carolina, near the near the old Intox building, it's in the CAT building, Center for Applied Technology, 511 Westinghouse Road at Pendleton. Um, um, we can register. You can register online at uh, through um, Eventbrite. This is my yeah, first experience right with Eventbrite, so it's it's on the screen. It's on the screen right there. Yeah. And or you can call in if you prefer to call in. You can call Jennifer Arblaster at uh, at that number as well, 864-656-2530. So. John, it's been enlightening. Uh, Alliance for Grassland Renewal, it's the workshop. Um, a lot of states are going to be involved in this, uh, in these workshops, and Clemson's big day is going to be March 13th coming up uh, extremely soon. Thanks for your time today. Thank we you. appreciate you uh, giving us a little information on this and, and look forward to seeing how the workshop uh, comes, comes, Great. To, Thanks, Bob. comes to full. Hey, we, uh, we appreciate you joining, joining us today and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next Extension Live. Thanks.